1990, Bill Eddington called me. I was an executive in Las Vegas. And he called me and he said he was coming down to Las Vegas and he'd like to meet me for lunch. And so we met for lunch. And at that time, he expressed to me a vision that he had, which was to develop a world-class educational program for casino executives. And one needs to understand the state of the world at this point in time, where the industry was heavily dominated by an unwillingness to share knowledge and information, and in which many aspects of the operation of the facilities was driven by myth, mystery, and superstition. The following year, 1991, Professor Eddington launched that program. Since that time, it has generated over $6 million for the University of Nevada and its affiliated entities. It has generated 1,100 delegates, and it has accessed those delegates from over 50 different countries around the planet. It is an amazing track record. It has unequivocally established the track record for being the premier educational environment in the, the world. One of the things that we've been able to accomplish with this program, or Professor Edenton has been able to accomplish with this program, is an absolute world-class faculty, many of whom are sitting in the back of the room. And, and I do want to give an award to Ann Chin. She traveled the longest distance to get here. She left Xi'an, China about four, year, <laughs> four days ago to, to get here, to, to, to be here for this event. Um, and while we can argue that this program is about Bill Edenton, or we can argue it's about the faculty, the fact of the matter, it's about you, the student body. What's amazing about this particular class is that just about every one of you have been accessed by your bosses, by your supervisors, by your mentors, by your friends to come here. This is a word of mouth environment and it's around the world. We have four people from Macau, Singapore, Venezuela, uh, Colombia, Latvia, Estonia, <laughs> Canada, that bizarre country, <laughs> a boat, <laughs> um, excuse me, Aaron, uh, the United States, tribal nations across the United States, North and South America, it's an amazing program and, and we thank you for making it what it is, the students. Um, I want to um, introduce a few people that are here. In 1975, I was invited to the Edenton home out in uh, the Washoe Meadows, <laughs> and um, I walked into a bedroom, and a three-year-old child had taken a whole group of crayons and put them together in a, in a bunch and decided to improve the artistic quality of the white walls that were in that room. <laughs> that person is still an artist. Sometimes he's an artist, sometimes he's a commercial artist, sometimes he's a starving artist, <laughs> but he's always an artist, is Bill's son, Michael Edington. Would you stand up, Mike? <laughs> the next person I would like to introduce is one of my absolute favorite people in the entire planet. <laughs> she is something. If God made fun something finer than this woman, he kept it for himself. Um, there's a picture of her. She. Um, Spent some time in the technology space. She worked for Sun Microsystem and Larry Ellison's firm. She uh, then decided to leave the technology space and join the motherhood space and uh, had three wonderful uh, children. And um, she's now back, a, uh, back as a consultant in that technology industry. She's uh, just the absolute, the best she is, and there's uh, her kids. The next person I want to introduce is um, one of the foremost authorities on poker in the United States, okay? Her cash game is Hold'em, but she can play tournaments across the board. And all of that's wonderful news, except for the fact she's nine. <laughs> Her name is Roxanne Reed. She's back here, and would you stand up, Roxanne? Here she's counseling Bill on a mistake. <laughs> She went through one of Bill's journal articles and what corrected the mathematics and is explaining that to him now. Um, here she, and, and that guy is, I don't know if you can see him because of the lighting, but here she's explaining to me 
that um, if you can't find the idiot at the poker game, it's you. <laughs> A lesson I've had to learn brutally over the years. Um, the uh, next person I want to introduce you to is the baby. This is Roxanne, by the way. She's dreaming about her 19 or 2024 World Series of Poker win, which is when she hits legal age. Um, the next person <laughs> is the baby. <laughs> this is Scarlett. Would you stand up, Scarlett, and let the people meet you? Yeah. This is Scarlett and her father. I didn't know he was coming. <laughs> also a dear friend. Interesting choice of uh, headwear. This is Scarlett again. And this is at her seventh birthday party just recently. She is the queen. Um, this is the one of Bill's grandchildren that couldn't make it because everybody knows when you're 11, you've got to have a spa day. <laughs> You know, I've fallen behind in the world. I just don't get how it works anymore. But apparently, 11-year-olds, when they go to 12-year-old's birthday party, they have a spa day. In the, and she's at a spa day. Once again, you notice around the Edington household, interesting headwear always. Um, and there's all three of them with some balding gentlemen. If you go to the Edington household in Crystal Bay, on the center floor, there is an incredibly important room called the kitchen, and there's nothing like the Edington women dining and preparing food in there. There's also a game room, which most people would call their living room. And when I say game room, you might think, oh, they have a card table up. Well, they do have a card table up, and that's for bridge and hearts. They also have a chess board up, and that's for chess. They also have a backgammon tournament area, and they have a full casino-wide poker tournament. <laughs> poker layout. It is the game room of all game rooms. As you go from that room down the stairs to an area of the home I like to call the shoot suite, <laughs> although there has been some debate as to its name, there is a photograph hanging on the wall and it is of a second grade class in Fullerton, California. It's Miss Higgins class. Is that absolutely perfect? And if you'll notice, there's a woman there, and that is Margaret Edington. And there's a gentleman there, and that is the gentleman sitting in this chair. These two met in second grade. <laughs> you know? Um, there are people in the world that think Bill Edington is the smartest people, person in his family. And the main characteristic about those people is that they have never met Margaret. <laughs> She's a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley. She occupied the mommy space for a while. She then moved off that space and went into work for um, a, a banking institution. And then she joined the uh, Trust for Public Land and was the senior executive in that organization and helped save a great deal of land on the, on the West Coast. If God made something better than her, he also kept it for himself. And this is Margaret and she's absolutely a wonderful position here. This was right after Bill had slipped in a cooler on that last night's game. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> there's another picture. I don't know where that came from. In 1969, I was meandering around aimlessly as a sophomore at the University of Nevada, and I walked into a classroom, and Bill Edington was teaching that class. He was either 22 or 23 at the time, quite thin, had a lot of yellow hair, and uh, had absolutely hated chalk. This guy ground through chalk like no one you've ever seen. He could go through boards and boxes of chalk at a ridiculous rate. Early on in our experience, we developed a little bit of a habit of talking about things. We like to talk about analytics and economics and gambling. And now 43 years later, when we're basically old men, we still sit around talking about analytics and economics and gambling. It's been a great run. And I would guess in about 20 years, we will be sitting around 
trying to figure out just what in the hell we used to talk about in analytics and economics and gambling when we basically can't remember anything. This picture is just to demonstrate to you that we both at one time had hair. <laughs> I was trying to think of a story that I could tell that would memorialize this event, and I couldn't come up with anything. And finally, I came up with a story, and the story is entitled, Two Letters. These letters were written by Diane Edington Reed. One of them was written to Dr. Borad in Scottsdale, who heads the targeted molecular therapy program, which has to do with the sequencing of the genomes in cancer treatment. The other doctor is a Dr. Korn at the University of California at San Francisco. And I will take a bit of license because I'm not going to read these letters, but Diana was kind enough to share them with me and tell you what they said. They said, dear doctors, I know I am the daughter of Bill Edington, who is your patient. And I know that you know a lot about my father based on his lab work and his x-rays and his CAT scans. But I thought I would tell you a few additional details about this man. He met his wife of 44 years in the second grade. He has had two incredible children. He has his PhD. He is recognized in his field around the world. He has lectured at the London School of Economics. He has lectured at the uh, Harvard Medical School. He has lectured at the uh, Kennedy Center for Government at Harvard. He has lectured at the University of Salzburg. He has lectured basically any place that there is a discussion about gambling in the world. The man has published over 150 articles. If you put the books with his name on it in a bookshelf, it will occupy numerous feet of space. He is the only academician ever acknowledged by the American Gaming Association in the Hall of Fame. He has recently received an honor by the National Council on Problem Gambling for a lifetime achievement. He is an incredible asset and the most recognized person in the world, be it in Asia, Africa, Europe, North or South America on the topic of gambling, its regulation, and its public policy. Diana then put together a collage, a collage of photographs. This included Bill with his family, with his wife, with his friends, and his grandkids. And she ended her note by saying, I wanted you to know that because I thought it was incredibly important for you to understand that your patient my father is an absolutely amazing man. It is my great pleasure to introduce my friend, my colleague, and for 43 years now, my teacher, the absolutely amazing Bill Edington. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Um, it really is my honor, and I'm humbled by, by your applause. And I'm always humbled and a little bit embarrassed by Richard's introductions. Um, <laughs> but, but, but again, thank you very much. I've been given quite a charge by Richard for this particular presentation. And after thinking about it for a considerable amount of time, I, I've decided there's no way I can separate the personal from the professional dimensions of my time over the last 43, going on 44 years. Therefore, I'll ask you to bear with me as I weave my story with the story of my gambling research. And I'm going to start very young. I was a precocious child who was very good in arithmetic from age four onward, and later very good in math in general. But more importantly, I was encouraged to believe I was special in arithmetic and math 
<coughs> by my, my parents, my parents' friends, uh, and, and those who I had crushes on and had admired so much. So as a naive and innocent kid, I had a pretty strong belief I could master the mysteries of mathematics. And as I grew older, especially as a college student, I realized one of my favorite areas was probability, especially as it related to games and gambling. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a small business family in Fullerton, California. My family was in the citrus business from 1921 onward. We had a company called Eatington Fruit Company, which when I was in high school, I had no end of uh, teasing about uh, the place where the fruits were. Um, but nonetheless, I, I felt uh, you know, quite blessed as a child in a, in a very strong and, and supportive household. I went to Santa Clara University as a math major, and I was grouped in with all the mathematical geniuses, especially those from Northern California. And what I soon noticed was that the real math geniuses were totally socially maladroit, the classic idiot savants that I'd heard about at a relatively in, as a relatively insecure high school student. Plus, these guys were a lot better in math than I was. And I think they went on to become the major intellectual leaders in Silicon Valley. And I believe perhaps they invented the internet. I decided to push my academic pursuits in a different direction. Inspired by some excellent faculty at, the, at Santa Clara University, I became a double major in mathematics and economics. As I was looking for an applied mathematics area that would keep me in the real world rather than the ter terribly abstract world of theoretical mathematics. That course of study led me to Claremont Graduate School in Southern California and a very fast trip through its PhD program in economics. I was always the youngest person in my class. And I took pride in that as well. When I went to Claremont, I was 21 years of age. And when I finished my PhD coursework, I was 23. For a variety of reasons, after passing my comprehensive exams, I then applied for academic positions all over the Western United States. And the most interesting offer I received was at the University of Nevada, Reno. For whatever reasons, Reno sounded a lot more interesting than Moscow, Idaho, Tucson, Arizona, or even UCLA. So in August 1969, my new bride, Margaret, and I packed up our Volkswagen Bug, and we moved to Reno. Uh, just to give a flavor for, I, I have to point out, time changes all. And so this was our <laughs> engagement party in uh, 1967. The little balloons in the picture are what we are thinking. Um, this little picture up on top here is a little hard to read, but it's Margaret's younger sister. So uh, we had a contest with a lot of our friends as to what were we thinking at the time. And this is what it came up. I'll, I'll just read you know, my comment, which I think I believed at the time. Marriage, is this a huge gamble? Margaret, what is up with his left hand? And then uh, Roberta commenting, I can't hold on to this dog much longer. It's peeing. Um, so that, that probably captures our level of intellectual competence of the day. Uh, we moved to Nevada in August of 1969. This actually is a picture of my aunt when she visited Nevada in the 1930s. But this is sort of the spirit of the state when we got there. No income tax, no sales tax, no inheritance tax, no corporation tax, no gift tax. A debt-free state welcomes you. And it was pretty much the kind of welcome I received. We came to Nevada uh, driving up uh, through the beautiful mountains. And Nevada in Reno is one of these cities that is always a pleasant surprise for people who move there or who even visit for any prolonged period of time. It suffers from a somewhat uh, uh, not great reputation, especially in the Bay Area. But the reality is it's a wonderful place to live and it's a wonderful place to visit. And aesthetically, it is almost as pretty as Lake Tahoe. It has gorgeous desert, gorgeous mountains, clear skies, and, uh, and uh, it's a right-sized community. The university, in their own way, gave me a, a very nice welcoming party uh, <laughs> when I did arrive in 1969. And you know, things have changed a bit since then, of course, but uh, I don't think they do this for new faculty anymore. Um, but one of the early things that, that occurred is I, I was very much enamored uh, by gambling at the time, and, and for, for some reasons that I'll, I'll go back to my, my text and, and read through. Um, when, I, when I got to Reno, I was by far the youngest faculty member in the economics department, if not in the entire university. I, I took pride in that as well. I think, regrettably, I've moved to the other end of that spectrum. Um, <laughs> and, and so I'm certainly climbing up the seniority ladder, if not the, 
uh, just the senior ladder as well. When I was in Southern California for graduate studies, I discovered Las Vegas in the same way that many other young people had discovered. It was exotic, gambling was legal, and it certainly was a different place than Orange County. My first couple of trips were with family, including my brother-in-law, who was as close to a professional gambler as anyone I had ever met. We both had recently read Edward Thorpe's groundbreaking book, Beat the Dealer on Card Counting, which spe spelled out a credible strategy to beat blackjack. So my brother-in-law played blackjack at the Aladdin Casino, and I stood behind him counting the cards, and together we won about $1,000, which was a big number in those days. So I took my share and thought I might become rich as a professional gambler, but soon realized the vagaries of Dame Fortune as I gave almost all of it back. So after that fantasy, it was back to my studies in economics at Claremont Graduate School. When I took the job offer at the University of Nevada, Reno, the city carried for me the same mystique I had seen in Las Vegas. Though not as glitzy and certainly not as hard and unforgiving as Las Vegas, downtown Reno, with its cheap drinks, favorable blackjack odds, and 24-hour action, was also a world away from the civility of Southern California suburbs. And, um, and I would point out here, I put the Nevada Club up here because you know, I would, when, on my first few days at the university, I was staying at uh, the College Inn, which is right on campus, and about four blocks away are the casino cluster in downtown. And the Nevada Club is one of the more eccentric casinos of its day. Um, at the time, they had blackjack, which they were playing with single deck, favorable rules. They would deal all 52 cards before they'd reshuffle. Um, and the, the betting spread was 50 cents to $500. And on my budget, that sounded phenomenally good. Plus, nobody in Nevada Club had ever learned anything about card counting, let alone could count beyond 22. Um, and so it, it was a very fun environment to go down and get you know, a 10 cent beer and, and uh, play blackjack and come home with $3.50 in winnings on a relatively regular basis. And I figured this is a great way to supplement the, the very, very low salary that the university was paying at the time. So at any rate, as a young assistant professor in my first couple of years, I was shopping around for a good dissertation topic that both my committee and I would find interesting. So my dissertation director suggested I look at Nevada gaming industry because of my interest in the topic and its obvious importance to the state of Nevada. I began my research fully expecting to find loads of prior research done on this unusual and still relatively obscure industry. As it turned out, the only studies of gambling one could find in the UNR library were either exposés of Nevada's casino industry, such as the, the Greenfelt Jungle, um, or Gambler's Money, uh, which were really stories about how the mob had infiltrated Nevada, corrupted politicians, and had pretty much bought this state and made it their own little fiefdom of uh, fundamental corruption. Uh, Gambler's Money actually was a bit more of an honest book than, than Greenfelt Jungle, but these were both national bestsellers and were very sensational. Or alternatively, they were books on how to beat the system, such as John Scarney's Complete Guide to Gambling, and he had a whole series of books on gambling uh, that he had published over the 1950s and 1960s, or Ed Thorpe's uh, Beat the Dealer. Nowhere could one find serious academic treatises on the economics, sociology, psychology, or the politics of gambling. What I did discover was my first insight into the real world of town versus gown. Academics, such as the professors in the business college at UNR, had no interest in the gambling industry. Indeed, for many of them, it was a bit of an embarrassment. For the most part, they came from jurisdictions where gambling was illegal, and the fact that Nevada's major employer and taxpayer was the gaming industry was hard to explain to their friends and family back home. Furthermore, anyone who wanted to study gambling must themselves have ulterior motives, sort of like people who want to study prostitution or illegal drugs. Gambling was not just a proper, gambling was just not a proper field of academic study. One should keep to the more traditional topics outlined in his or her discipline. So one might imagine I did not meet with tremendous favor when I suggested that uh, I might like to not only study gambling, but even teach courses in that field. Anyway, I went forward with my research agenda for my dissertation. And when I started publishing scholarly articles following its completion, the skepticism from other faculty followed. In 1972, when I proposed a course in gambling to be taught as an upper division economics course, it created one of the more interesting college faculty meetings I've ever encountered. Grudgingly, I got approvals to teach the course. And in the next couple of years, I was able to line up guest speakers, such as Harold Smith, who was one of the founders of Harold's Club, 
who came into my morning class one day with a six gun and was far from sober and gave a three hour lecture that I don't think anybody understood two consecutive sentences. Uh, <laughs> Phil Hannafin, who was then chair of the Nevada Gaming Control Board, and it was shortly after his meeting with Howard Hughes in London. Uh, Howard Hughes was supposed to appear before the Gaming Control Board uh, to get his license, but he refused to show up anywhere in public. And so when uh, Mr. Hannafin and Governor uh, Mike Callahan met with him at the time, uh, they later described he had hair down below his shoulders, he had fingernails five inches long, he sat in a, uh, a Mandarin position, and uh, was otherwise quite coherent. But he was Howard Hughes. He died of starvation about three years later, um, carrying with him, of course, the, the empire of casinos that he had acquired in Nevada in the 1970s. Uh, we also had Robert List, who was the state's attorney general and later the governor, and Peter Griffin from Cal State Sacramento, who is an was an extraordinary mathematician and the author of The Theory of Blackjack, uh, someone who Elliot Jacobson, I'm sure, is very familiar with in terms of his work. My early students were also a distinguished lot, including Richard Schutz, who's in the room, Terry Oliver, who you heard the other day, and Larry Wolf, who happens to be here as well. Uh, and I caught them when they were all students at UNR they all went on to uh, illustrious careers in the gaming industry. And it, as well in the class, we had a variety of Nevada politicians and policymakers. So it was, in retrospect, quite impressive. That was the gown side of the picture. The town side also had some surprises for me. Almost from the outset, representatives of northern Nevada's gaming industry were highly skeptical of what I was up to, about the only things they had seen coming from academics and scholars over the years were screeds that attacked the morality of gambling, that suggested gambling was the first step on the road to perdition, and that everyone in the casino industry had come out of Steubenville, Ohio, or Hot Springs, Arkansas, Havana, Cuba, or other sin cities in the United States and abroad. In other words, casinos and gaming were an illegitimate industry with a lot of mobsters who had infiltrated our otherwise pure state. Of course, there were some well-known characters behind many of these uh, allegations. Bugsy Siegel had indeed played a critical role. Oh, by the way, when we, when we did move to Reno, this was our, our first house, and this is our VW Bug, which we named Herbie. I think our kids made us name it that. And we lived uh, at a place on uh, Eden Court near uh, Virginia Lake, for those of you who know Reno. Um, we're there for a couple of years. Um, but of course, well, and we, uh, yeah, I have to point this out too. Richard already showed you my family, but I might as well as do it as well. By 1970, we were well ensconced in Reno. This is Margaret, myself, and uh, very young Diana. And then along came Michael, and life was never the same. <laughs> but now we get to the, the more interesting characters who I'm about to talk about. Um, you know, and this, this gets back to the character of the reputation of the gaming industry. Uh, Bugsy Siegel, who we heard about the other day from Matt Isaacs, had indeed played a critical role in developing the Flamingo Casino in Las Vegas, but he ended up in a bad way. Uh, you can sort of get the idea here. This is, you know, he isn't a Dalmatian. He really uh, was a normal looking person until somebody put a number of bullets through his face. And this is how he appeared in the FBI photos about four hours later in, uh, in Beverly Hills. Uh, Meyer Lansky was a key player in financing uh, the gaming industry. He was pretty much the financial genius for the casino industry in the 1940s and 1950s, bleeding into the 1960s, so to speak. Um, and there were some other notable Las Vegas gaming executive owner, executives and owners such as Mo Dalitz, uh, who's up here, uh, Tony Cornero, uh, Benny Binion, um, who had acquired pretty notorious reputations along the way, uh, even though when they got to Nevada they, they did uh, legitimized to, to a certain degree, but there was always that question that would come back about their past. The gaming industry of the day did not have an overabundance of choir boys. When I organized the first national conference on gambling and risk-taking in 1974 at the Sahara Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, we were able to attract about 40 delegates and 25 academic papers from throughout the United States and Canada. Uh, when we put out a press release in the Reno papers, we got a very interesting response from the president of Harris Reno, Shep Shepperson, who issued his own press release a couple of days later that stated, what do these academics know about the gaming business? We are the real experts. 
In particular, they took offense at one paper on the program that was entitled, How Gambling Saved Me from a Misspent Sabbatical, by a Canadian psychologist and professor named Igor Kusijan. Uh, Igor also happened to be a very substantial gambler who about 10 years later got into trouble with the Canadian authorities because he and his students had set up a syndicate to uh, basically uh, make book on, on the races in, in Ontario. Um, but, but Igor, well, it was very well intended, his misspent sabbatical. And he was one of these people who, like myself and I think Elliot and maybe a few of the other people you've seen here, were obsessed with gambling, but not as a player, but more as a, an area of study and an obsession with all the interesting little issues that it can bring up. So at any rate, I, we were getting some flack from Harris, and I was 25 years old, so I didn't really fully appreciate the underlying politics of all this. So in response, I contact, or contacted George Drews, who was the controller at Harris, and who I knew uh, through some mutual friends. And I asked him if he would be interested in putting together a session at our uh, first national conference on gambling and risk taking on Harris gaming operations and their business strategy. And to my surprise, he accepted and he organized an excellent session on how Harris had used scientific management strategies to enhance their business and especially to strengthen their off-peak and midweek traffic in Reno and at Lake Tahoe. <clears throat> For a number of years, Harris, which was by this time a publicly traded company, it had utilized the Stanford Research Institute to help them strategize their, their marketing programs, and in many other ways, they had been incorporating very sophisticated research and evaluation programs to enhance their business. In other words, Harris was running like an awful lot of mainstream corporate America of the 19... Uh, 70s. Needless to say, the Harris session at the conference was a great success. But more importantly, it really impressed the academics and researchers who were in attendance, many of whom had a very stereotypical prejudice about the casino industry. Here was a company with MBAs and senior level executives who could have been running an airline company or a hotel chain or an insurance company. The fact was that they were in the casino business, and this came as quite a shock to many of the academics uh, but a very pleasant shock. And I believe this opened the door to future collaboration, not only with Harris, but with many of the other casino companies who had also been very suspicious of what academics might say about the gaming industry. Indeed, the vice president of marketing for Harris, Mark Curtis, invited us to have our next conference in 1975 at the relatively new Harris Lake Tahoe, which we did. And of course, Harris Lake Tahoe is uh, only about 183 yards from where we sit. The next conferences took place in 1976, 1978, and 1981, all in Nevada. We started increasing the time lag between conferences uh, for three main reasons. First, we, we still only had a limited pool of academics and researchers who were really interested in gambling. And so asking them to produce significant new research papers every year was taxing their abilities. Second, the organizational requirements to put on such conferences was becoming increasingly complicated. And since I originally did all the work myself, it was getting tougher and tougher to do a good job every year. Uh, so we incorporated the assistance of the Bureau of Business and Economic Research at UNR and the College of Business, and we worked into a routine where we had conferences every three years, and that seemed to provide exactly the right pace. But the third reason we created this lag in conferences uh, was perhaps the most important. Events in the gaming scene in the United States and throughout the world were becoming more dramatic and were helping shape the research agenda for the conferences. Atlantic City had legalized casinos in 1976, with the first casino opening in that jurisdiction in 1978. Visibility of Atlantic City within the shadow of Wall Street certainly increased the attention that the casino industry got from both the financial community and the national media. Regulatory turmoil in the United Kingdom in the 1970s created a growing need for competent research and policy analysis for that country. Following the death of Franco in Spain, uh, that country legalized casinos in 1978. The Netherlands had legalized state-owned casinos to combat illegal casinos in Amsterdam and Rotterdam in the early 1970s. And Australia began to legalize private sector casinos in the early 1970s, partly to combat the illegal gambling that was so much of the culture of that country. And so we were seeing a sea change in legalization uh, all over the world, and the conference just happened to uh, coincide with these, these international events. The 1981 conference, the fifth national conference 
on gambling and risk taking was held at Caesars Tahoe Resort whoops, excuse me, um, and casino and really represented the sea change in the tone of our conferences. The number of papers presented by this point exceeded 100 and attendance was over 200 delegates from all over the country and for that matter uh, a, a significant international component. For this first time we had a large contingent of British delegates to the conference, many of them coming from the British casino industry um, and a few regulators as well. There were also representatives of Gamblers Anonymous from the United Kingdom and officials from the Netherlands and Spain. But perhaps most dramatically, we had about 100 card counters from Atlantic City and Las Vegas who attended the conference. And perhaps the most spirited symposium session was one that pitted the card counters against the casinos on blackjack policy and procedures in Atlantic City. And this was really the, the, the high point for card counting as a, in effect, a profession because the rules in Atlantic City were established in a manner that the casinos had no discretion on how they dealt the game and so the game had rules and procedures that could create roughly a 1% advantage for professional players playing optimal strategy and there was nothing the casinos could do about it. Ultimately they asked the governor uh, to issue an executive order as an emergency edict so they could suspend the rules which the governor did. Uh, the casinos then started banning card counters the card counters sued and it went all the way to the Supreme Court in New Jersey. The Supreme Court found in favor of the card counters on the argument that they could not ban players strictly because they were using their intelligence with publicly available information to play the game. And at that point the uh, regulators acquiesced and gave, uh, gave the casinos the discretion to move the cut card uh, wherever they wanted to and that pretty much took care of the entire problem. That process probably cost 30 or 40 million dollars to go through. But replacing the cut card is quite important. Um, presenters that year included a very young Phil Satry. This is not a picture of a very young Phil Satry, but not a bad picture nonetheless, uh, you, who you heard from a few days ago. Uh, and Phil spoke on a report on the New Jersey Casino Control Act and related regulations on the Harris Marina Hotel Casino. Um, and this was really my first opportunity to work with Phil and I've had a, a very strong relationship uh, over, for over 30 years working with Phil on a variety of projects in his various roles with, with Harris and more recently with IGT. It always has been a pleasure. There were other papers given at that conference by uh, Dr. Ed Thorpe of Blackjack fame and by this point Ed Thorpe had really shifted into the financial markets. He became quite famous for some of his arbitrage strategies and he ran a company called Newport Princeton um, which uh, turned out to be one of the early hedge fund companies that was quite successful until they ran into problems not too dissimilar from uh, Michael Milken's problems in the late 1980s. I, I would speak on uh, Dr. Thorpe's behalf. It was the, the Princeton part of the team rather than the Newport Beach, California part uh, that created the problems. And so Ed was, uh, it remained a typical innocent academic, I would have to say. <clears throat> but you know, his papers were entitled the, the House Take and Options Market and Greed and Fear in the Stock Market, papers that probably have some relevance today as well. Indeed, Dr. Thorpe's work anticipated the arbitrage and derivative strategies that have dominated financial markets over the, over the last three decades. There was another obscure paper that happened to be presented at this uh, 1981 conference by Randall Chapman, a mathematician. Its, its title was An Empirical Analysis of an Optimal Wagering System, which basically outlined how one could exploit paramutual horse race markets. And it was just, you know, it was a typical mathematician paper, but it was one that provided a very strong methodology that one of the card counters in the room, a fellow named Bill Benter, who probably was 22 years old at the time, he took the paper, he analyzed it, uh, he moved to Hong Kong and set up a business and started developing a computer model uh, that utilized this paper as its basis. And it took him, he told me, about six or seven years to get all the bugs out. But the point was to try to exploit the inefficiencies in the very large paramutual horse racing betting market in Hong Kong. And over the decade of the 1990s, Mr. Benter and then two other companies that sprung up who sort of mimicked his strategy, they took well over $100 million out of the paramutual market in Hong Kong uh, just by exploiting these inefficiencies. In the 2000s, there's an Australian syndicate uh, that's still operating called the Punters Group, uh, based in Australia, but it, you know, based on court documents, has generated gross winnings throughout the world in excess of 5 billion US dollars. By applying the same algorithms to paramutual and other uh, fixed odds betting markets, everywhere in the world where gambling is legal. 
So who is to say there's not valuable information to be found at gambling conferences? So anyway, that was the 1981 conference. It was a, you know, very much a, a highlight of our entire uh, series of these conferences. For the ne next conference, we hit the road and ran the conference in Atlantic City in December of 1984. Uh, no one had told me the weather in Atlantic City in, in December sucks. <laughs> to our surprise, our attendance fell from our, our Nevada experience. We didn't realize that the East Coast was a harder group to crack, a, a bit more cynical, um, probably more pragmatic and hands-on and not as interested in academic research as on the West Coast. Nonetheless, we continued to get a heavy dose of Europeans, of mathematicians, and of psychologists studying problem pathological gambling, so it turned out to be a, a very successful conference anyway. We started to publish the proceedings of the conferences, and we changed the name of all the future conferences to the International Conferences on Gambling and Risk Taking, because by this point, a good third of our delegates were coming from abroad, you know, many from Europe, a uh, smattering uh, from Asia, and a, a very good contingent from Australia. Um, I, I point out that in 19, 1986, I hired Judy Cornelius, who at the time was an undergraduate at UNR, uh, to assist me in organizing the seventh international conference on gambling and risk taking, which took place in uh, Reno in 1987. And then we formed the Institute for the Study of Gambling and Commercial Gaming in 1989, and I was able to hire Judy as the associate director of the Institute for the Study of Gambling and Commercial Gaming in 1989. She remained in that position uh, for 22 years, and she became the, the backbone not only of the gambling conferences that continue to run to this day, but also of this particular program. She was there at the outset, and it was me and Richard and, and Nigel Kent Lemon and Judy uh, who really were the core of organizing the first uh, executive development program in 1991 and continued uh, until Judy stepped down uh, two years ago from this particular program. Um, in 19, we returned to, as I said, to Reno for the sixth conference. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, had, had I not had Judy in that role, I don't think the conferences would have gotten as big or as professional as they did, and we certainly couldn't have done the kind of publication and outreach that we were able to do. We've published all together now, I think, 14 books related to uh, papers and proceedings from the conferences or themed around uh, the various conferences. Um, so, you know, the, the, the entire program continued to grow not only in scope but also in reputation as we became known as the premier academic and for that matter industry conference in the world. And I think we continue to carry that reputation. At any rate, bravely in 1990, we decided to organize the 8th International Conference in London at the, uh, at the Royal Garden Hotel in Kensington, which now I don't think we could afford to buy a cup of coffee at. Um, but nonetheless, it turned out, again, to be a very successful conference, this time with a, a very strong international contingent. We had as one of our uh, guest speakers, or one of our keynote speakers, uh, the head of one of the major Nevada gaming companies. And I still think this is a, a very dramatic uh, statement of how Nevada was looking at the expansion of Nevada, or expansion of gambling outside of Nevada, uh, this particular individual, who's very much a, a typical Nevada executive, very well polished in a Nevada sense, but a, in many ways a good old boy, and uh, a, a backslapping, you know, good communicator, et cetera. He got to London and was speaking before an audience representing perhaps 20 countries, but he didn't realize he was not in Nevada. And I, I don't think he appreciated that things could be at all different anywhere outside of Nevada. And, uh, and this really was, was a bit of a metaphor for what happened to many of the Nevada companies when gambling started to expand in America, and for that matter overseas, uh, from 1990 onward. Uh, the first few steps that you know, very famous major companies would take outside of Nevada would quite often run into the problem that they didn't realize other jurisdictions had different cultures, different priorities, and didn't consider the gaming industry the most wonderful thing in the world. Because that was pretty much the attitude of, of what happened in Nevada. And if you take a, a, a very big fish in a very small pond and put that very big fish into a much larger pond where all of a sudden it's sort of a small fish, the world changes. And so you know, I think you know, we had learned through the, the conferences and then later through this program uh, that that indeed was the case. But I think the industry lagged our, 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 our learning curve and it took them a few more years to fully appreciate the nuances and subtleties of how you do business in Asia, how you do business in Europe, how you do business in Canada. 
uh, and every jurisdiction carries its own uh, unusual characteristics. The ninth conference, we pushed back one year until 1994 so that we could take advantage of the opening of the MGM Grand in Las Vegas and the unprecedented boom that had occurred in Las Vegas since Steve Wynn returned from the wilderness of Atlantic City to build the Mirage and then the Treasure Island. And of course, that was also the period of time uh, when the Excalibur was built and perhaps most importantly, when, uh, when the MGM opened. And, and Larry Wolf happened to be the president and CEO of the MGM at the time um, and invited us to have the conference at the MGM, but they didn't open until December of 1993. So we had the conference in June 1994. Uh, very kindly, Larry said, would you like to stay in my room at the MGM while you're in your conference? I said, sure. Well, it turned out to be the Tom Jones room, which was two stories, I don't know, 5,000 square feet, a butler, uh, you know, room service with you know, capability of serving 16 at a, at a beautiful sit-down dinner, uh, a, a spa and hot tub that overlooked the strip, and many other amenities across, across the uh, hallway from the Barbara Streisand suite, but she wasn't around that week, regrettably. Um, but, so that was a very nice conference we had in 1994 at the MGM. Um, <clears throat> subsequent, after, after that conference, we held subsequent conferences in Montreal in 1997, went back to Las Vegas in 2000, went to Vancouver in 2003, and then our last two conferences were held in, in Lake Tahoe, in, at South Lake Tahoe at Harris across the street in 2006, and then again in 2009. I am pleased to announce that our next international conference on gambling and risk taking, oh, I'm sorry, here, here are the books that were out of sequence. These are two of our roughly 14 publications that came out of the conferences. and, and uh, I think the artwork on this, I have to point out, was done by my son, Michael. Um, you know, we, we keep everything in the family as much as we can. It keeps costs down, among other things. But gambling, public policy, and the social sciences, these are classics that are still available on Amazon, um, you know, sometimes for, for $15, sometimes for $600, depending on how lucky you might get. And this one's called Finding the Edge, which we co-authored with, uh, or co-edited with Olaf Ankura. Uh, but we've done a number of these books. Some of them are just uh, you know, phenomenally good in terms of either their, the mathematics underneath them. We've published two books that are specifically in mathematics, uh, two or three specifically on public policy, a couple on, on business and, and marketing and, and, and related issues, uh, a couple of books on pathological gambling and, and related topics. So it's a very good library for anybody who's a, either a true scholar of gambling who, or who needs to get a sense of what the research is. Um, and you know, we've continued with the conferences. This was the, the brochure for the 14th uh, International Conference in 2009. But I'm pleased to announce our next international conference on gambling and risk taking is scheduled for Caesars Palace in Las Vegas uh, in May 2013. And this should be the biggest and best ever. And for the first time, we've partnered with the International Gaming Institute at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and have, sta have established a very strong working relationship with the, the director of the International Gaming Institute, uh, Dr. Bo Bernhard, who was supposed to be here. He's, he's the fellow who had to cancel on his presentation because he has a, a sick child this weekend. Um, and, and as well, we have a very strong working relationship with the dean of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, Harris Hotel College, Don Snyder, who's also in the room this afternoon. I expect this partnership is going to be a permanent fixture into the future. In 1989, we decided to form the Institute for the Study of Gambling and Commercial Gaming at the University of Nevada, Reno, within the College of Business. And we did this because by this point, we had too many balls in the air, and this was a way to coordinate our various activities and provide greater visibility uh, for our, our activities. I was appointed director of the Institute, and as I'd mentioned before, Judy Cornelius was hired full time as an associate director. And I would point out that uh, Judy Cornelius' salary was the only financial commitment that the University of Nevada, Reno had ever made to the Institute. And for the most part, we were self-supporting uh, from revenues that came out of this program, out of the conferences, out of book publications, um, and publishing other authors. So, so we had to be self-sufficient e even as early as the early 1990s because of the fundamental realities of, uh, of university financing, and especially state university financing. Um, we now have an institute uh, that ran our conferences would publish a wide variety of books related to gambling and casino management that could con conduct research and sometimes contract research and would interface with national and global media on policy related issues. The fact that this was occurring when casino gaming was exploding throughout the United States 
and in many other countries gave us a lot of attention. Uh, at this point in time, riverboat casinos were just being authorized in Iowa and later in Illinois, Mississippi, Louisiana, Missouri, and Indiana. Mining town casinos had been legalized in South Dakota and Colorado, and Indian gaming was popping up all over the country, bolstered by the 1987 Supreme Court decision, uh, Cabazon versus the state of California, and then by the 1988 passage of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. In 1989, oh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to bring up my picture of Bo uh, Bernhardt, who I, I, I sort of view as the next generation for you know, the dinosaur academics who are about to phase out. Um, but it, this, this gets to where I am in my text. Um, in 1989, we coordinated the first North American conference on the status of Indian gaming, and this was held at the, uh, I think it was called the MGM still, it held in Reno. Um, much to our surprise, on the opening day of, of this North American conference on the status of Indian gaming, we had 500 people show up at the registration desk, uh, all American Indian tribal members or Canadian First Nations members, um, and we had no idea they were coming. And so it turned into a very spirited three-day conference with speakers ranging from Senator Harry Reid, who is currently the uh, majority speaker in the Senate, uh, to former Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, along with a large number of iconic tribal leaders and notable academics. Uh, this is the publication that came out of it. We still have it available through the Institute, and uh, those of you involved in tribal gaming, I, I really recommend you, you buy it. Even though it's 20 years old, it really has tremendous insights into not only the perspective of tribal leaders, politicians, and academics 20 years ago, but almost all of these perspectives still carry credence today. Uh, some things don't change terribly dramatically, uh, but the one observation I would make that I find fascinating is there was a real sense among a lot of tribal leaders that the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act was really a, a substantial attack on their sovereignty and that they were very fearful that it would undermine tribal sovereignty and, and tribal identity. And one of the ironies here is we had a situation of the, the young Turks and old well, I'm not quite sure how we would describe it here, that the old leadership got it wrong. The young leadership, who were mainly tribal attorneys in their mid-20s to mid-30s, said, I don't think this is so bad. This might turn into something that is relatively valuable. At this point, in 1989, the, the amount of gaming revenue for Indian gaming in, in North America was perhaps a billion dollars. Uh, by 2011, it has surpassed $27 billion and is about... Uh, 40% of all the casino gaming that takes place in the United States. So it has become a formidable, formidable presence, both economically and politically, uh, throughout the United States. So this particular conference uh, was very, very interesting in terms of its dynamic, probably the most emotional conference I've ever attended in terms of the, the passions of the people who were involved, uh, and many of whom were tribal members, of course, who were very committed uh, to their particular perspectives. So at any rate, this brings us uh, closer to where we are today. The other major program we developed through the Institute, uh, beginning in 1990, was the Executive Development Program. And our ad initial advisors, of course, were Richard Schutz, who in 1990 was a very high-powered gaming industry executive, as, as I'm sure he's told you many times. <laughs> and the late Nigel Kent Lemon, who was one of those British businessmen and consultants who discovered us at Lake Tahoe in 1981. And for me, this was relatively new ground. I had taught my gambling classes for the previous 17 years, but I'd never made a direct effort to go after senior level executives in the casino industry. The underlying concept of the EDP was to create an intense boot camp, and I think some of you might agree with the term intense, for mid-career casino management, where they could step out of their professional responsibilities for a couple of weeks and test themselves on cutting edge concepts and strategies from gaming experts throughout the world. I recall at the very first executive program in 1991, the discussion around casino managers who never said what they knew for fear of revealing what they did not know. The prevailing management strategy in many casinos was learning by negative reinforcement. If someone made a mistake, then he or she gets punished. There really was not much in the way of mentoring or training as we understand it today. The old school of casino management still had a significant presence, especially in Nevada. The dinosaurs in casino management were those who had come up through the ranks, either in Las Vegas or Reno, or from offshore locales such as Britain, 
the Caribbean, or South Africa. They were often juiced into their jobs by powerful managers above them, and loyalty was far more important than knowledge. The attitude was that the only way to learn the casino business was to be in it for 20 years, to work every position, and experience everything that could happen on the casino floor, and to keep your mouth shut. As one of my colleagues, the casino executive Dean Maycomber, wrote in an, an important article on casino management, leaders of most casino or organizations exhibited a monopoly on brains. Only the guys at the top were smart enough to make the important decisions, and everybody else should just follow. Of course, they often were not that smart, but they weren't going to admit it. Many casinos, especially in Nevada, succeeded in spite of themselves. But the casino industry was clearly in transition by 1990. Atlantic City was far more corporate, and it hired a lot of college and MBA-trained managers. Publicly traded corporations such as Harrah's and Hilton had already adopted scientific management practices and evidence-based decision-making. Many foreign casino jurisdictions never had dinosaurs, but rather began their gaming industries with professionally trained management. With the rapid legalization and proliferation of casinos everywhere, there was clearly going to be a strong demand for well-trained and competent casino management. So as with the gaming conferences we started 20 years before, we really caught the crest of the wave for executive training. Since 1991, the executive development program has evolved in a number of very positive directions. We have had the good fortune of attracting delegates over the years who either were or were destined to become important leaders within their companies, organizations, governments, or tribes. And as Richard mentioned, we now have had over 1,100 graduates over our 22-year history. We also benefited by the quality of our uh, faculty over the years. We have had such industry royalty as faculty as Phil Satray, who you did hear from this year, Gary Loveman, the uh, uh, CEO and chairman of the board of Caesars, Glenn Schaefer, who uh, played a similar role with uh, Circus Circus and Mandalay Bay. Uh, Don Snyder, who uh, had been CEO of Boyd Gaming. Uh, Chuck, Ed Chuck Adwood, who had served as chief financial officer for Harris. Ben Christensen, who played a similar role at Station Casinos. Bruce Rowe, who you heard from, who is also in the room today. Paul Steelman, who you heard from a couple of days ago. And Scott Butera. Regulators have also played a major role as faculty over the years, including Bill Bible, uh, Mark Liparelli, Bill Galston from the United Kingdom, Bill Curran and Pete Bernhardt, who you'll meet tomorrow. The academics we've used are a bit more obscure just because they don't get the kind of visibility that industry executives or regulators get. But I have to give a nod to my UNLV counterpart, Professor Bo Bernhardt, who I believe is the future for UNLV's International Gaming Institute. And also Dr. Larry Barton, who's participated in almost all of these programs, but who was unable to participate this year, who is one of the world experts on crisis management within organizations. Um, Perhaps the most notable development for the executive development program was making the cases a focal point of the entire program, which I, I think some of you might appreciate at this point. It took us a few years to get them really going, but since the mid-1990s, the cases are what delegates seem to remember most about this program. Each year, we create about eight teams from our delegates, uh, and we create as much diversity as we possibly can, geographically, in terms of casino experience, uh, levels of responsibilities and areas of responsibilities, and training. So each team has to act as if it represents the larger company uh, that we've created for it in addressing the case. And the real objective, of course, is to win. And we've discovered that gaming industry executives love to win. They are among the most competitive group I have ever encountered, which is why I think none of you took any of the day off yesterday to explore the beauties of Lake Tahoe. Loyalties and friendships from these teams often go on for years after the program. In fact, I know a number of CEOs who have not only their certificates framed on the wall, but pictures of their teams. And it's not at all surprising to call somebody up who lives half a world away and ask them, have you ever encountered this particular situation? So some of you might expect that kind of follow-up uh, when you leave these beautiful halls of, uh, of Harvey's. The cases have always tried to anticipate things happening or about to happen in the gaming industry. So over the years, we've had competitive bidding processes uh, to win licenses for casinos in Paris, Macau, Singapore, Taiwan, Spain, southern France, Cleveland, Massachusetts, Thailand, and this year, of course, for Manhattan and near Washington, D.C. We've had companies respond to the unprecedented new competition in Las Vegas in 1999, uh, where we basically took all a number of existing companies and said, OK, these guys are opening up this year. Bellagio, Mandalay Bay, Paris, the Venetian, and the Aladdin 
what are you going to do about it? And it turned out to be very interesting with the company that had the most trouble being the Mirage. Um, and you might think about why that was the case. <coughs> um, we've also uh, designed temporary and permanent casinos for Detroit. And these all were before the reality actually occurred. In uh, 2005, we went in and rebuilt Biloxi, Biloxi's casino industry after Hurricane Katrina had literally destroyed virtually every casino in that uh, gambling town. We reacted to the Great Recession with a case uh, in 2008 built around Las Vegas called The Other Side of the Strip and basically took uh, a number of the legacy properties and said, okay, uh, the world is collapsing around you. How are you going to respond to the dramatic financial and, and market changes that have just happened to you? And, and again, we got results that very much have reflected what has occurred in the four years ever since. And, so we, all, and we also did last year a very good uh, turnaround study uh, where we created a hypothetical challenged casino in the state of California that had all the management problems that you might find in a very troubled casino that uh, you know, had decided to fire its professional management team and then bring in uh, you know, the brother-in-law of the tribal chair to, to run the slots, etc. So for the most part, the teams take this very seriously, often staying up until the wee hours in the morning to refine their strategies, their written documentation and oral presentations. We also bring in expert judges, many of whom are already in this room uh, for this year, from throughout the casino industry and from other places to evaluate team performance. We award substantial prizes to the winning team, such as UNR baseball caps and bumper stickers. <laughs> and the winning team always takes its bragging rights back to their various companies. And typically, the, the winning team members insist that next year's delegates from that same company do even better. You've got to hold up the, the pride of our particular organization. I, I suspect a few of you are under that kind of direct order today. Under the College of Business and the Institute, we've also developed a number of other notable programs. From 1995 until the year 2001, we had a, a major in gaming management at the University of Nevada, Reno, along with a minor and an area of specialization in gaming management at the MBA level. We had to drop the major in 2001 because we just didn't have the resource base to offer all the required courses on a regular basis. But the minor and specialization programs continue and continue to be very successful in terms of performance and placement of our graduates. When we had the gaming management major, we were also fortunate enough to hire two former uh, Harris Corporation executives to teach in the program. Lou Phillips, who was the former president of Harris Northern Nevada, was awarded the Mead Dixon Chair in Gaming Management from 1995 through 2000. And th this gave us the financial basis with which to hire him as a, as a permanent, well, as a uh, full-time faculty member over this period. Lou was a real gem as a faculty member and inspired a number of our, our, our majors to pursue careers in the gaming industry. The other executive was Randy Baker. Both of these people Phil Satray worked with for a number of years. Um, and, and Randy's specialization was government relations and corporate communications. And again, he brought a, a skill set that as an industry representative and as a very good communicator was invaluable for our, our, our majors and for that matter other uh, students who chose to take his courses. Again, the contact that, that Randy was able to make uh, was especially strong for that era. One of the most satisfying parts of my 43, going on 44 years at the University of Nevada, Reno studying gambling all the good and great people I have met and have gotten to know very well as a result. First on that list, of course, is Richard Schutz, who happened to be a student in the first two classes I ever taught at the University of Nevada, Reno in 1969. I still can see him slouching in the front row. At least he was in the front row, but his slouch was pretty dramatic. <laughs> We've remained close friends ever since. Um, there are others in this room who taught me much professionally and became friends personally, including Terry Oliver, Doyle Andrews, Larry Wolf, and, and Richard Wells. There's, of course, my good friend Richard. I also had the pleasure of meeting, with Phil, meeting Phil Satry for the first time when he was still an attorney in Reno in 1979 and, in, uh, and working with him from time to time in his various capacities as an executive and CEO with Harris. And Phil has always been the cons consummate professional <clears throat> and in many respects has been way ahead of the rest of the gaming industry. In 1987, for example, Phil invited me to help Harris develop a strategy to deal with responsible gambling within the organization. And this is at a time when most of the casino industry in Nevada and New Jersey were still in total denial as to the existence of problem in pathological gambling. 
Phil's also been a very generous supporter of higher education over the years, especially as it relates to the University of Nevada, Reno, and the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And this has certainly been a critical contribution to the ongoing success of our various gaming-related programs. Others in my list of the good and great include my late friend, the Reverend Gordon Moody, who was the, the founder of Gamblers Anonymous in the United Kingdom and was arguably one of the most unusual Methodist ministers I'd ever met, a, a very humane and, and empathetic individual. Uh, I also uh, met through the conferences my good friend, the late David Spanier, a uh, former foreign correspondent for the London Times and an author of numerous books on gambling, poker, chess, and on Las Vegas. Also, my very good but late friend, Nigel Kent Lemon, uh, a Londoner of tremendous class and judgment. And Nigel introduced me to the inner sanctums of the major British casino companies, which gave me great insight into how corporate decisions were actually made and uh, sort of broke the ice on how you talk with casino executives. Because again, at that time, I still was sort of a, a raw academic. And, and industry executives, whatever industry, were a bit distant and hard to reach. But you know, once you sort of got the right introduction, they were just like anybody else, and quite often very much in need of good information and good concepts. And so it turned into a, a very, very strong relationship. Nigel also served as the co-moderator of this program from its beginning in 1991 until his untimely death in 1998. But not all my friends are dead, thank God, as Richard will attest. <laughs> Another good and great friend is uh, Andrew McDonald, uh, who is now Senior Vice President for Analysis. Uh, I think he's Senior Vice President Global for Analysis for the Las Vegas Sands. Andrew became co-moderator of the Executive Development Program after Nigel's passing from 1999 until 2009, when he received an offer he could not refuse. He went from basically various industry positions with companies like Genting, Jupiter's, uh, Sky City in New Zealand, to an advisory position with Macquarie Bank based in New York City uh, in 2009. He was then approached and appointed to be Senior Vice President for Casino Operations at the Marina Bay Sands in Singapore, which meant he ended up running the highest grossing and most profitable casino in the world for the last two years. I do not think it's an understatement to say that Andrew applied many of the principles of casino management that we have developed in this program to make the Marina Bay Sands the success that it presently is. There are many others I could mention, including many who are in this room, and my apologies if I've left you out. I've now entered that, I've now entered that period in my career when I'm receiving accolades more than I'm writing papers and conducting research. And I've done pretty well in this area, including being awarded the Philip G. Satre Chair in Gaming Studies. Um, you can almost see the ghost of Phil Satre if you look very carefully here. But that chair proudly sits in my office at the University of Nevada, Reno. I also was given an honorary doctorate uh, from the University of Macau in 2008. And this is an honorary doctorate in business honoris causa, which I think means for just as an honor. But nonetheless, it, it really was. And University of Macau, along with their sister institution, the Macau Polytechnic Institute, uh, have a, a group of strong, young researchers who are very interested in doing the same kind of thing that my institute at UNR and the International Gaming Institute at UNLV are doing. And obviously, they want to do it with the Asian flavor. And because that industry is now um, six or seven times the size of Las Vegas and four times the size of Nevada in general, they certainly have a good case to make. I was uh, honored last year, about this time of year, by being inducted into the Gaming Industry Hall of Fame, which is sponsored by the American Gaming Association. Um, and my other uh, award recipients included, this is one of the founders of the Blue Man Group, which has become a very famous entertainment tour or group that is touring all over the world. Uh, this happens to be Charlie Palmer, who runs a string of very high-end restaurants, including a couple in Reno. Uh, this little guy is called Sheldon Adelson, who you might have heard of for other reasons. And then the, the real tall, good-looking guy is me, of course. <clears throat> and we were all inducted into the Hall of Fame, and I was, I was honored and, and a bit humbled to be in uh, such august company uh, as well. And then uh, just this last summer, I was given by the National Council on Problem Gambling the Herman Goldman Lifetime Award for Advocacy Related to Problem Gambling. And I'd served for 30 years on the board of the National Council, and I was really the outsider because I'm, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a, a health services or helping services 
uh, kind of person, but I do understand the public policy dimensions of uh, gambling in general, gaming in general, and the importance of problem gambling fits in that bigger picture. And I think as, as many in the, the industry now appreciate, it is arguably the most important political dimension that every jurisdiction, almost every jurisdiction, has to address in one way or another, and one where many jurisdictions throughout the world in the last 20 years have really come around to trying to address in a reasonable and uh, proactive way. There is one area of disappointment that I am compelled to mention. I am very sorry that I have not yet been able to, to sustain support from the University of Nevada, Reno for the continuation of the various gaming programs that we have established over the last 40 years. In 2009, funding for my staff at the Institute disappeared, primarily as a result of the financial crisis that the University and the State of Nevada confronted in the wake of the Great Depression. Nevada was arguably the most adversely affected state in the United States and the university ended up losing about 30% of its state-funded budget over the next couple of years. In 2012, I was informed that if I retire or die, my position will not continue. Though we could request a new position to represent the economics and gaming areas that I've covered for the last 44 years. Obviously, my incentive is neither to retire or die. <laughs> and I've pretty much told them that there, there's a British economist by the name of Jer uh, Jeremy Bentham who left in his will a very large chunk of money to the University of London. But he said, as a condition, I have to attend every board meeting forever. And so what they did is they mummified Jeremy Bentham. <laughs> they, they have his body in a wheelchair in a closet at the University of London. His head is detached, but it's in a box that sits on his lap. And every meeting, they roll him out. <laughs> and he sits at the end of the table. And in my will, that particular clause is there. Um, and this is really just so we can continue my university salary indefinitely and somebody else can step in to cover my classes. It might work at any rate. In my opinion, these administrative moves by, the U, by UNR are very short-sighted. Both through the international conferences that I talked about earlier and the executive development program, not to mention our publications, we have established a global brand of substantial value with the Institute for the Study of Gambling and Commercial Gaming. I would suggest that with the exception of sports teams, the Institute gets more coverage in the media than any other organization or institution at the University of Nevada, Reno. One would expect a college of business and a university striving for excellence would appreciate the benefit cost computations of such a brand. But there is a silver lining here, which does create some good news for the University of Nevada system of higher education. The College of Hotel Administration at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and its Dean Don Snyder, are very committed to the concept of Nevada being the research and intellectual capital for gaming worldwide. And unlike UNR, UNLV is willing and able to continue financially supporting their International Gaming Institute and its various activities. This suggests an obvious strategy for my institute as well as for UNLV. We should continue to pursue joint programs or to merge the existing UNR programs with UNLV, especially if UNR continues to uh, decide to drop the ball in this particular arena. However, and this again is part of the silver lining, once you step outside of Nevada, there is relatively little distinction that people make between the two major Nevada campuses. So eventually, merging the two institutes will not destroy the brand. However, we have always had a very strong product differentiation between the two institutes and their programs. UNLV has done an excellent job over the years in applied gaming management, primarily due to the pragmatic nature of its course offerings in the hotel, restaurant, and casino management areas. UNR, on the other hand, has had a very strong presence in gambling policy issues and in gaming-related research. And I believe having a separate institute at UNR even if it's a relatively small presence, is mutually advantageous to both universities. At one level, it is useful to be able to make observations about Las Vegas from outside Las Vegas. Sometimes issues are so politically sensitive within the Las Vegas gaming community and within that environment, and at UNLV for that matter, that faculty members feel constrained from speaking their minds. Believe me, I have never felt such constraints. <laughs> Finally, there is the Philip G. Satray Chair at UNR, which by my understanding is the property of the University of Nevada, Reno. 
I cannot see how my university can eliminate my position and still honor its commitments to the donors who created the Satray Chair with gambling research and gambling study as a very important component of that chair. Anyway, that's my diatribe. In closing, I have to return to a very personal level. I have been truly blessed. With this support I have received from my family and friends, especially over the challenging times I've had to confront this past year, excuse me. In that respect, I'm truly blessed. So I want to thank my wife, Margaret, my children, Michael and Diana, my son-in-law, Darren, of course, my beautiful grandchildren, for all the richness and love they bestow upon me, and especially over the past year. Thank you very much.